Hello, ladies and gentlemen, I am the learning cat. No, no, I am the grand cat. Hi, guys. Uh, no, I'm not Chris Jericho. I am a big old grand cat. And I want to talk about the state of AEW. I'm going to do a little bit of a review of AEW Dynamite. It's not what I normally do, but I haven't watched AEW Dynamite properly in a while, like watch it from start to finish. And the reason that I watched this episode of AEW Dynamite is because it directly followed on from AEW All In. Now, All In is essentially AEW's version of WrestleMania. It is supposed to be their biggest show of the year, of uh, which it was a really, really good show. Me and my friends watched it, me, Baron and Edge Marquee, we all watched it together. And for the most part, it was a good show. There, were, there was a couple of things. I didn't really like the Mercedes Money match. That was that was horrible. Um, I think the Casino Battle Royale kind of needs to be ironed out with its rules a little bit. I think there was a bit of strange things there. But overall, yeah, fairly good. And the really spoiler, so if you haven't seen All In, make sure you watch that. If you haven't seen Dynamite, don't worry, nothing happens. Spoiler. It is... It was terrible. <laughs> Dynamite was awful. There, there. If, if that's what you wanted to hear, you've heard it. Now, I really like AEW. I think AEW has the potential to be really, really good, be really, really amazing, but all the problems, all the good parts were at AEW All In, and all the bad parts were on AEW Dynamite. And I want to go over this because I've been watching wrestling since 1999, which is 25 years now. And I have seen a lot of the ups, I've seen a lot of the downs, of course I've went back and watched all the horribleness of both WWE and WCW back in 1995 and such, um, going all the way back to the golden era. So, I like to think I'm a well-informed fan, doesn't mean my opinion is any better than anyone else's. And also, I do want to hear about you guys as well, so do leave me comments in the comment section below as well. But let's get on to AEW Dynamite. So, as I said, the reason I watched AEW Dynamite is because I was very excited to see what happens after All In. Uh, I thought AEW All In was an amazing show. I thought there was uh, some really good storylines that came out of that, and I wanted to see where they went. And what we had at the start of the show is, here's the announcements for everything that's going to happen on tonight's show. <clears throat> the returning Jamie Hayter is going to face... Harley Cameron. Why? Why? Where, where did this match come from? Uh, sure, Jamie Hayter returned after being away for a year and a half at AW All In. She, she now looks like Becky Lynch for some reason. She didn't look like that before. Before she looked like Blair Davenport. And uh, I don't know what is going on there. Again, nothing to explain it to us. No storylines. Uh, does, does Jamie Hayter hate Harley Cameron? Was there there's something going on there? What? Why didn't Jamie Hater just get in a microphone and say, "I'm back and here's what I intend to do. I'm going to go after the women's championship. I'm going to go after the TBS title. I'm going to go after the person who injured me, Tony Storm." You know, like um, where was any of that? Where was the explanation? Then we have um. Hangman Adam Page, who had two big showings, he was booked very, very strong in the Casino Battle Royale, I believe, and then he came out and practically cost, or certainly distracted, Swerve Strickland and allowed Brian Danielson to become the new AEW World Champion. I mean, Brian Danielson didn't win exclusively because of Hangman Adam Page, but he certainly hindered, you know, he was certainly a part of the finish. And now Hangman Adam Page has a match against Tomohiro Ishii. And I was thinking in my head, okay, maybe I, I haven't been up to date with AEW Dynamite. Maybe Tomohiro has had some feud with Hangman Adam Page. And then they announce this will be a match for the first time ever that Hangman Adam Page will have ever faced against Ishii. And I was thinking, why? For what reason? Where's the storyline? And then I remembered I'm watching AEW Dynamite and the whole reason is, is because Tony Khan thinks that these two would be cool in the ring to each, uh, with each other. 
that these two, looking across the ring from one another, have would put on a strong match, and there's no storyline behind it. There's no reason for them to go against each other. It, I, I guess the match, Hangman Adam Page won, by the way, and he won clean. He just won with a buckshot lariat. Made him look a bit stronger, but why? We'll get into that a little bit later on. Brian Danielson will address his future. Well, I sincerely hope so. He's the AEW World Champion. I'd be surprised if he didn't come out and say something. Swear Strickland will speak. Um, He technically did. Mariah made championship celebration, which lasted all of, what, 30 seconds? Where she came out with her robe, took, out the, took off the robe. She was just wearing her re- usual wrestling attire and had the title around her waist. Then put the robe back on and said, that's enough. And then walked into the back. And um, the, the main event is Ricochet versus Kyle Fletcher. Why? Ricochet has literally just debuted in the company. He hasn't said a single thing on the microphone. We don't know what his intentions are. We don't know what his storyline is. He's just here to put on a nice, flippy, aerobatic ma- match with Kyle Fletcher. Also, like in terms of Ricochet joining AEW, right, there are people who were only watching AEW for CM Punk. There's people that were only watching AEW for Samoa Joe. There's people that only watch WWE for Roman Reigns. There's people that only watch WWE for Cody Rhodes. There is not a single person on this planet that said, I only watch WWE for Ricochet. And if Ricochet is gone, well, then so am I because I'm going to head over and I'm only going to exclusively watch AEW now. Because the reason why is because no one's invested in Ricochet because he doesn't have any storyline. That's the problem. He could be the greatest wrestler in the world. Hell, Cesaro is a really, really good wrestler. Lance Storm, really good wrestler. But if you don't have any storyline, if you don't have any personality, if you don't have any aura, no one's going to care about you. And Ricochet had a chance. This was his debut in a new company, which he hasn't done for a long time. When Ricochet was in NXT, people cared about him until he was brought to main roster, and then he became the mid-card guy, he became the one, he became the Dolph Ziggler for all intents and purposes, and this was Ricochet's chance to have a brand new fresh start, and what did they do? They take his microphone off him, they don't let him speak, and he has a match with Kyle Fletcher. Great. It didn't do anything for him, if anything, it pretty much bowed him. And, and then, of course, we have, for what I can only presume is no reason, Chris Jericho, Big Bill, Brian Keith and Roderick Strong in what I like to call a box of squirrels match versus Hook, Orange Cassidy, Kyle O'Reilly and Mark Briscoe. Why? What? What's the point of this? I understand Chris Jericho versus Hook because that was a match that happened at All In, so... You know, there's a little bit, you know, even if they don't continue that feud, it's nice that they're looking across the ring from each other. Can let Chris Jericho move on to another opponent, let Hook move on to another opponent. Okay, but in Big Bill and Brian Keith, they were there for Chris Jericho. So, yeah, that makes sense. And Hook needs some friends. So we've got... Orange Cassidy in there, and Orange Cassidy, what did he do? He was in the Casino Battle Royale All In and had a pretty, pretty strong showing against the likes of Okada and such. He was Okada and him were, num- were number one, number two, and um, didn't do much after that. And it seems that they don't have any plans for him after this either. Uh, you've got Mark Briscoe, who's who, who looked confused as to why he was there when he was doing the promo. He's the Ring of Honor World Champion, and he's like, why am I here? And they're there because they're part of the conglomeration. And the conglomeration might as well be called the, here's a bunch of guys that we didn't know what to do with, so we pushed them together. And really, Hook and Orange Cassidy shouldn't be standing so close to one another because they have the exact same gimmick, and you're just... You're, like, you're literally just showing off that you have just copied the homework 
of the person next to you because that is exactly what AEW is doing with Hook and Orange Cassidy where he's the really cool laid back guy who is a very very strong fighter when he's pushed to shove but other than that he was backstage eating Doritos and it's like <sighs> and then you've got Kyle O'Reilly in there and because Kyle O'Reilly's on one side, Roderick Strong is on the other side. And Roderick Strong even said in the promo that he didn't like Chris Jericho, but he was willing to work alongside him if he could help get Kyle O'Reilly away from Orange Cassidy. Is that a good reason for Jericho to team with someone that he doesn't like? For... Roderick Strong to be part of the Jericho Vortex? Jeez, man. Alright. Let's go over what actually happened in Dynamite. Now that we've d we've done the brief rundown. Uh, so, um, it started off with a returning John Moxley, who came out with new music, he's got his hair shaved, he's trying to look his he's trying to look his best like Stone Cold Steve Austin. He's doing his best Stone Cold Steve Austin impression. And obviously they don't know how to book this angle because Tony Giovanni, the second he sees John Moxley come down to the ring, says, oh, let me get a microphone and I'll go and interview him, you know, and gets in the ring with him. And then John Moxley does this really cryptic, you know, like it, almost the Scott Hall thing, you know, you know who I am, you don't know why I'm here. It was almost the exact same promo it's like but John Moxley hasn't really been away for any great length of time for it to have a huge impact and then Moxley you know sticks his finger in Tony Schiavone's chest and says this isn't your AEW Dynamite anymore and Tony Schiavone even says on the commentary desk it was never my AEW like he doesn't own it you know and and I'm guessing that in John Moxley's mind, the audience would all be like, oh, I wonder what that means. Oh, oh, I wonder what, oh, I'm really excited. You know, no one cared. No one cared because people didn't understand it. And maybe it will have some payoff at some point in the future, but I, I genuinely didn't care. Uh, John Moxley didn't come out and explain what he wanted to do or what he was going for. Uh, later on, John Moxley has a little bit of a further promo where he says that it's about time that people get humbled, but it, it just felt like, here's John Moxley, he's back, but now he's a heel. And that was all that they were saying with that. And it's like, <sighs> all right. Great. Um, so what happened next? Uh, then we had the... What do they... Oh, there was uh, a promo. Um... Yeah, Willow Nightingale says that she's going to challenge Chris Dantlander to a Chicago street fight it all out. Cool. Good for you, I guess. Why? <laughs> um... Then Hangman Adam Page defeats Tomohiro Ishii in a for no reason match. Also, this was the thing, right? This was the first match, and I believe it had two sets of adverts, and the adverts were picture in picture. And I have a basic rule. If AEW doesn't care enough to to, to cut away from the action to go to adverts, I don't care enough to watch it. Because nothing will happen in that picture in picture. There will never be a point at any point where there's something picture in picture where something huge will happen while the adverts are on. It's never going to happen. So you don't even have to watch it. You may as well skip through it. And if you're skipping through that, you may as well skip through the entire match because nothing happened. It was... It... But what it feels like is see if you ever put on WWE 2K, any of the 2K games, and you put on universe mode and you just decide to skip five years in and then you watch a random pay-per-view where you've got no idea what's going on, you, there's no storylines, you're just watching fights for the sake of fights. That's what this was. 
it had nothing going for it. This this is AEW's problem. They just don't know how to do stories. Uh, let's see. Um... So yeah, after after Hangman Adam Page wins, after Hangman Adam Page Hangman Adam Page wins clean, then Swerve Strickland comes out, and is Swerve Strickland annoyed that he lost the world title? Is he planning to get some kind of, you know, some kind of like rematch with Brian Danielson? Is he planning to climb the ladder and get that belt again? No, no. Instead, he brings up. The three matches that he's had with Hangman Adam Page, and Page says, you couldn't beat me. Um, you know, the first one was interference, second one was interference, third one was, went to a 30 minute time limit draw. And Swerve Strickland says, I was really annoyed at you because when we had the world title match against Samoa Joe, you deliberately tapped out just so I wouldn't get the belt. And that's what this feud has all come to. And what it ends up Accumulating to is Hangman Adam Page doesn't want any outside interference. Swerve Strickland says, I don't need any interference. How about we take all of them out and we have a match inside of a steel cage? And it's like, oh, you know, a big reaction for the audience. And it's like, it was such a, it was such a 90 degree turn where Swerve Strickland was all about the championship, all about winning, all about retaining his belt and being the guy on top, being the champion. And now it's, okay, now now I'm going to go deal with Hangman Adam Page. And screw the belt, I guess. And Hangman Adam Page is like, I, I didn't even want the belt, I just wanted to beat you. I just wanted to prove that I could. And it's like... This is what you would call filler that I don't know what Swerve is transitioning into it feels like Hangman Man Adam Page is at some point going to be the number one contender down the line but we've got to do this pit stop here first and we have this breakneck speed of jumping from one storyline into another storyline with nothing really tangible in between other than that these two have been in the ring with each other a couple of times before. And then we have Jamie Hayter defeats Harley Cameron with Soraya for no reason. Why, why did these two fight? I mean, Jamie Hayter's returned. She was injured by Tony Storm. Tony Storm was part of the Outcasts or the whatever they were called. I think it was the Outcasts. And... Saria was there. Saria is part of the outcasts or the original outcasts, um, along with Ruby Raya and Tony Storm, or Ruby Soho as she's called in AEW. And um, did she get her revenge by defeating Harley Cameron? Is is she planning to do a Liv Morgan revenge tour where she's going to try and go through all the members of Outcast? Um, well, we don't know because she didn't say anything. It, they, they just. This is literally once again Tony Storm saying, These two are good wrestlers. How about we put them in the match together? And that will make the fans happy. What would make the fans happy is if there was some storyline, if there was something that connected these dots. Um, the backstage segment with. Chris Jericho, which was probably one of the better promos of the night, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, saying that um, he doesn't mind that he lost the FTW Championship to Hook because Hook has finally learned from the learning tree and he's proud of him for winning the way that he did. So that's, uh, that's Chris Jericho done with the FTW Championship. He's going to move on. However, he can't move on because later in this very night he has a match basically against Hook in a 4 on 4 match so so th this is just going to continue is it alright well that's cool I guess 
then MGF comes out and he addresses what happened at All In that well, MGF had the match won until Daniel Garcia decided to stick his nose in the business. Then he gets a Tiger Driver 91 from Will Ospreay. And is MGF annoyed at uh, Will Ospreay, you know, for, for breaking his neck? And MGF now has this new gimmick that he's decided to turn his back on America. With the exception of the, the one small area that he comes from uh, in New York. I can't remember what his planes something or other. But... No, uh, MGF instead addresses Daniel Garcia. And then Daniel Garcia, who is supposed to be the babyface, attacks MGF in his injured neck from behind. And then the entire thing is that he wants to do the pile driver off the top rope that was the move that injured Daniel Garcia. And then, during the same thing... Daniel Garcia announces on the microphone that he's already talked to Tony Khan and that he's going to have a one-on-one -on -one match against MGF at All Out. Why? I mean, I understand it. It's just like... Also, is this not exactly the same storyline from the previous segment of Hangman Adam Page and Swerve Strickland? And also, like, why is everything, like, why does everything have to be, like, a straight 90 degree turn? You know, there's, like, there's no crossover from, like, the previous feud or anything that they had. Will Ospreay wasn't even in the building for this. And I'm sure he'll show up on Rampage or one of the other 14 AEW shows. Plainview, Long Island in New York, that's what the MGF is from. I remembered. Um, then, then what did we have? Oh, also Garcia. Like, to, to put fire into the fuel, he said that he took MGF's diamond ring and he pawned it so that he could afford the trip to London so that he could interfere in MGF's match. So, is that the storyline? Does that... This feels like when a writer writes something and then doesn't know how to get out of the the corner they paint themselves into, so they say in a throwaway line that, oh yeah, no, that, that didn't matter, that didn't happen. I remember specifically the end of Metal Gear Solid 2 that, I think it's Metal Gear Solid 2, yeah, that um, Snake finds out that the Patriots are all... Like, they've all been dead for, like, 300 years. And then in Metal Gear Solid 4, which Metal Gear Solid 3 doesn't announce any of that, Metal Gear Solid 4, you find out that the Patriots were actually just the names of the computers, and the names of them were stuff like George Washington and things. So, yeah, it wasn't, like, people that were 400 years old. It was just computers that were named after these people. And that kind of throwaway line is basically what was thrown in here. It's like, oh, so now MGF has a real reason to fight Daniel Garcia because he stole, he sold his diamond ring. Jesus. Uh, then you got the all, the eight star, the eight man all star box of squirrels tag match, which uh, it, was, it was just a mess. <laughs> It's not even worth discussing. And then after the match, we're just we're just going to skip that match because it, it was just trash. Right, so this is the thing. Let's, let's talk about it actually a little bit. WWE doesn't do these four-person versus four-person things anymore. It was, it's largely just used to get people on the card. It doesn't get anyone over. It doesn't make anyone look strong. It doesn't forward any storylines. And this is largely why Vince McMahon wanted to get rid of Survivor Series because it wasn't doing anything. And now Survivor Series has largely just been replaced with War Games. It's now Survivor Series War Games. And War Games at least makes sense because it's not just Box of Squirrels. It's not eight people in the ring immediately. Instead, people are drip-fed, like, 
you start with two people in the ring, then a third person enters, and then a person from the the other corner comes in, so it's now a two-on-two, two, and it drip feeds in. Then once everyone's in, then it turns into the actual match, and then you've got the... Like, so it has a build-up to it, and then there's like, oh, now someone could lose, now someone could be pinned, now someone can submit... And if they if they submit, then they lose the, the like their entire team loses. So you know there's stakes there now, but this is just no no just everyone just all in the ring all at once. It's 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 just bad. Then you've got the backstage Mercedes Moan hosting a party for another successful TBS championship, and she is doing see the CEO chant. It's horrible. No one chants alongside her. Like, even when she was doing it backstage, she wasn't going, CEO, CEO. You know, she was, she almost sounded like she was ashamed to do it. She was almost whispering it. She was like, CEO, CEO. You know, like, as if, like, Tony Khan had a rifle, like, just off screen saying, like, if you don't do this, you know, then, you know, you're 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 not part of this company anymore, you know. And I was thinking to myself, what would Mercedes Monet be doing right now if she was Sasha Banks and she was back in WWE? And do you know what she would be doing? She would be in the exact same role that Zelina Vega's in right now, because that's pretty much what her part her personality is at the moment. Like unless. She can really step up. Oh, it's 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 not going well for Mercedes Money. I think everyone can relatively agree that she is not the draw that Sasha Banks was. So, private party come out during her little backstage party, and. The, basically, they promote that she's going to have a match for the New Japan Pro Wrestling title on Friday against Momo Watabani or Wata, Watan, Watanabe, sorry. And then the private party boys attempt to hit on her, but Okada appears, and then Monet says to Okada, how do you say bye, bitch, in Japanese? And he says, oh, it's sayonara, bitches. And it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> What what is this? And then she went back to doing a little CEO CEO. And it's like oh my god. Oh my god, she's she's horrible. And also, I don't care about New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, I, I'm sure it'll be a very good match, but I don't want to see it advertised on like the the all in Dynamite Fallout. And that was all she did. She didn't. She wasn't promoting AEW in any way. It's like, uh. um, then Mariah May, she had her AEW Women's Championship celebration, which was not any better. She came out with a robe, took off the robe. She didn't show anything, obviously. She just had the title around her waist, and then she covered it back up, and then she said, that's enough, and then she walked backstage. Great. Uh, then Grizzled Young Veterans, they started grilling the Young Bucks, saying that they're coming after the tag titles at some point, and Young Bucks were like, yeah, nice to meet you guys too, great first impression. And then there's, they had a backstage segment where they said, um, regardless of who Gri Grizzled Young Veteran are going to be up against this r this in Rampage, you'd better grit your teeth. When it said in the bottom left corner that they're against the, what was it, the Outbacks, the Outlooks? But they didn't even know who their opponents were. <laughs> that's that's how badly this is booked. They were like, oh, we we don't we don't care who we're against, and it's like in the bottom corner, it's like here here's who you're against, guys. Um. Then Ricochet came out. He defeated Kyle Fletcher in a for no reason match. John Moxley was backstage again and he says oh you need to learn a lesson in humility and then he walked off and nothing was accomplished there 
Brian Donaldson comes out. He addresses the future. He's, he pretends that he's going to retire with a belt. And he says, no, no, I'm not. And then this is the stupidest thing of the, the entire night. He says that instead of anyone earning a shot for the AEW world title, he's just going to announce an open invitation. The first person to come out will be the person that gets a title shot at All Out. And Jack Perry, he's already got a promo set up on the Titantron. He finishes it with... Your my future's ahead of me and your future's behind you. And then Jack Perry is supposed to be behind Brian Danielson and attack him from behind, which would be a very cool segment. If it was done in WWE, Jack Perry would have been standing there and the camera would have panned around to show him. But because this is AEW, Jack Perry basically attacked Brian Danielson before the promo had finished. And it looked like crap. It's The production value is bad. Jack Perry doesn't know timing he doesn't know to like if this was undertaker he'd have stood there menacingly until brian danielson had turned around and went oh my god and then it attacked him you know or wait until the promo finished and then you know brian danielson's looking at the the titantron going my future's behind me you know like like questioning it and then jack perry attacks him but no uh, th- there was a good setup there and they ruined it as well so it's like great and and then AEW finishes, AEW Dynamite finishes with Jack Perry holding up the AEW Championship and the TNT Championship. So, there you go. So, why, why does it have this whole breakneck speed? Why does it not, like, we basically didn't even talk about All In. Basically, all of it was like, all right, guys, AEW All In's finished. We've got to be like, move on. Go- Hurry, hurry the hell up. Everyone get off stage. We need to bring in like all these new things. And do you know why? It's because AEW All Out is a week on Saturday. That's right. All Out is two weeks after All In. Could you imagine if WrestleMania was followed immediately two weeks later by the next pay-per-view and they weren't allowed to do any of the matches again? They weren't allowed to have any... WrestleMania rematches that everyone all has to fight someone else now? Why would you book All In and All Out two weeks apart from each other? If All In is supposed to be your WrestleMania, which is what they're claiming it to be. It was in Wembley Stadium. It was in... It was a stadium arena. It's... The first all the or not the first the previous all in that was held in Wembley was the the biggest turnover that they had seen the the most amount of fans and such and um, uh, you know I really I really thought that we were going to get to see the continuation of some of the storylines that we saw at all in because all in was a really good show and instead. No, uh, instead we're just going to take a hard left turn here rather than continuing down the story. You know, I mean, MGF had this huge story with Will Ospreay. Let's take this side road divergence with Daniel Garcia because he interfered, he interfered near the end of the match. Swerve Strickland had this really great story with Brian Danielson. Well, no more of that. That's finished. Let's have... Hangman Adam Page go up against Swerve Strickland next. Who is Brian Danielson's next opponent going to be? Well, it's, it's just going to be an open invitation and Jack Perry's going to come out because he's not doing anything better, I guess. It's like... Oh, why? And also, like, you know, Darby Allen doesn't want any any return match against Jack Perry for almost being, you know, set on fire, burned alive. And Sting had to come out and save him. We're not going to. We're not going to discuss that. We're not going to talk about any of that. No, no. Dar- Darby Allen's just fine to, to let that slide. <sighs> WWE wouldn't be like this. Like, AEW doesn't even feel like bad WWE. It feels like bad WCW. Or it feels like bad TNA, where 
the creative's bad, people don't know what they're doing, storylines are just flung around. But worse than that, AEW just has matches put together because Tony Khan thinks these two could have a really good match against each other. And it just seems like Tony Khan doesn't understand that people really want to see storylines and the wrestling really is secondary to the storylines. Like, if you've got a really good storyline but the wrestling match is crap, yeah, it ruins it. But if you've got the two best wrestlers in the world going up against each other, you still need there to be some thing in there. Something on the line, something that means that this person wants to fight this person for this other reason or you know if this person loses you know this horrible thing will happen either they will either they won't be allowed to challenge for the title again or they're they'll lose their career or they'll get their head shaved or you know their 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 faction has to split up or something or it's like you know if, if the person loses and they lose their title you know they're going to lose everything they've they've worked hard for and everything or you know it should build up a, an even bigger storyline like I'm, I'm pretty sure that we all knew that Drew McIntyre versus CM Punk wasn't going to be finished after their first match and this is what is happening with AEW you can't be invested in AEW because it doesn't pay off because you aren't going to get your big proper finish to Swerve Strickland and Brian Danielson like the people in charge of AEW don't care enough. And that's what sucks. Their pay-per-views are really good so long as you don't watch the weekly crap like Rampage and Collision and Dynamite because it doesn't go anywhere. It's almost as if the only thing worth watching in AEW is the pay-per-views. And that really, really sucks because I want to be invested. I want to care about these characters. I want to know what's going on with them. And also, sometimes wrestlers will just disappear. Not because they're injured, just because creative have nothing for them. And sometimes they disappear because they're injured. And some of the time, I, I, I think people are just trying to see how much money they can get off of Tony Khan and still be on the payroll like, I I think Miro has been away for almost two years now, <laughs> still collecting checks. He even moved back to Bulgaria. He isn't even in America any longer. And um, Kenny Omega, he's he's off an injury. He might never come back. But you know, there's there's people out there that have legitimate injuries, and then there's other people. I can't even remember half the people that have disappeared. People that I used to care about. People like Penta and, you know, Pentagon Jr. and Ray Phoenix and, ah, oh, there's so many. FTR weren't even on the show. House of Black weren't on the show. So many people weren't anywhere to be seen. None of the rest of Blackpool Combat Club were out. Like, Blackpool, Blackpool Combat Club came out and celebrated with Brian Danielson. You know, there was... Claudio Castagnoli, formerly Cesaro, obviously. Um, you had Pac, you had Wheeler Utah. The only one you didn't have was John Moxley because people thought that John Moxley was away on injury. And then John Moxley comes out, you know, on Dynamite, completely fine. And it's like, oh, I thought John Moxley was going to be the one that was going to jump Brian Danielson, but nope. No, didn't care. Because I thought the whole thing was that John Moxley was leading up to a, a you know, that. I'm the bad guy, you know, it's like, how dare you consider retiring or whatever. Something like that. I thought that's where we were going with that storyline. Also, another reason that I watched AW Dynamite is because I had heard that apparently this is where Shane McMahon was going to debut. Not at all in, not at all out, on a random episode of Dynamite. And I don't know why I listened to those people, because that was a stupid, stupid idea. But it's so stupid that it's almost the kind of thing that AEW would probably do. So, I mean, that's even assuming that Shane Man wants anything to do with AEW. He, he had a talk with Tony Khan, and, you know, even if 
Shane Man does sign with AEW, he could very well just be a backstage role rather than an on-camera role. And um, what happened with the storyline with Jack Perry and uh, Tony Khan? Did Jack Perry just stop caring about Tony Khan and move on to the TNT title? I thought his whole thing was that he was annoyed that he was the scapegoat. He's still calling himself the scapegoat, uh, you know, for CM Punk getting fired. But okay, I guess we don't care about that anymore. Uh, there's there's so many storylines that so many storylines that were really really good until they weren't, and that is basically AEW in a nutshell. The only thing AEW needs to compete. Maybe not with maybe not with Raw and Spider, but certainly to compete with the likes of NXT and such, you know, to get people watching it, to get people caring about it, is literally someone that can write a story that can make us care about the characters. Turning Mercedes Money a heel was one of the best decisions that they made because no one liked her and absolutely get her over as a heel. But don't have her as a boring heel. Have her as a heel that, you know, we we hate. You know, that it's like Oh, I want to see her beaten. I want to see someone take the TBS title off of her. Not, oh, Mercedes Money is on the screen. Let's change the channel. Because there's a difference. There's an absolute difference. But regardless, that is the end of my 40-minute rant on AEW. I really would like AEW to be better, and it's it's not. And I'm just thankful that WWE is as good as it is, because at least it gives us something to watch. And um, AEW pay-per-views are generally good, but could be better. But the AEW storylines are hideous, and the booking needs to improve if they expect people to continue watching this. That's it for this video, folks. Let me know in the comment section below. Do you agree with me? Do you think the grand cat is full of crap? Do you think that everything that I said is entirely wrong or is AEW your favourite thing and you think that it can do nothing wrong or do you agree with Scran Cat or do you even disagree and say actually some of the things, some of the nice things you said about AEW are also wrong <laughs> because I'm really really curious to hear the Grand Cat Grand Fleet's ideology your opinions, your reviews of AEW in its current state. Because AEW has been fantastic in the past. Had some of the best things. I remember being so excited with the the TNT Championship when Luke Harper won it as the, the leader of the... What was it? The Dark Order? When he was the... Um, he was you know, number one, you know, or he was number zero even, he was the, the prestigious one, um, and his son was, like, negative one, like, I remember that being huge, and, you know, he had that amazing, I, I believe it was a dog collar match with Cody Rhodes, uh, where he lost the title, and I remember that just being, like, really, really cool at that point, uh, I remember being very excited about belt collector Kenny Omega, until, until it wasn't, you know, where Kenny Omega was going around winning all the world titles of everything. <laughs> and, um... The, like, the beginning of AEW was really, really good. And a lot of people speculate that it was really good because Cody Rhodes was the one booking it. And when he left to go to WWE, that's when things started kind of falling apart. I was also really excited for the return of CM Punk. Both times he returned to AEW... And both times it didn't really work out. <laughs> so uh, I I think AEW has the foundation to be good, but they've burned the audience just a bit too much, whereas WB is on fire. It's like the best it has been since the era of Stone Cold. So let me know what you guys think in the comment section below really want to hear you guys opinions but that is going to be it for this little video i really hope you all enjoyed and if you did enjoy this rant please give me a like share and subscribe and if you are subscribed make sure you click that notification icon so you can see when more of these glorious little videos go out and we shall see you all in the next video goodbye everybody